Welcome to Game of Thrones Abridged with Alt Swift X, the only podcast that analyzes George Martin's books at the same speed at which George Martin writes his books. This is episode 108, and we are talking about the fourth Jon Snow chapter in the second Game of Thrones book, A Clash of Kings. This is A Cock Abridged. Before we start, I would like to say happy birthday to Yoni. Alex told me that it's your birthday, Yoni, so I hope you have a great day. Happy birthday. Now let's talk about John. This is a fun episode because John gets to play in the woods with his dog and he finds buried treasure and it's a good time for everyone involved. This is also a chapter about a ill-fated military expedition with Lord Commander Jure Mormont marching 300 crows to their doom north of the wall. Uh, this is also a chapter about spooky trees. Everyone is concerned about the spooky trees and the smell of cold. Uh, Clash of Kings is very much a spooky, mystical, horror story sort of a situation. That's very true in Bran's storyline. It's also very true of Jon's storyline. This is a chapter about going boldly into the unknown and finding the boogans, scary ones, scary boogans. So let's let's talk about it. <clears throat> the first sentence of this chapter is. The hill jutted above the dense tangle of forest, riding solitary and sudden, rising solitary and sudden, its windswept heights visible from miles off. Because the ranging of Night's Watchmen has arrived at the fist of the first men, which is this big hill that looks like a fist punching up through the earth, its bare brown slopes knuckled with stone. Uh, it's quite hard to visualize what a hill that looks like a fist looks like. I've seen a lot of attempts by artists to illustrate what a hill shaped like a fist looks like, and a lot of them look weird. Like the graphic novel artwork of this looks quite odd. Some of the illustrations look odd, but it's a, it's a, it, it's a, it feels like a good description, and it reminds me of the description of Storm's End, the great castle of Storm's End, which has its great drum tower thrusting up into the sky like a big middle finger to the gods, because Storm's End was built in defiance of the storm god who kept trying to destroy and tear down the castle. And this hill, this fist. You know, it, it, it feels defiant, you know, defiant against the wild. And that's what the N Night's Watch are trying to be. They are trying to defy the dangers of, of the wildlings and the winter and the white walkers and all the other W words. And they're trying to stand firm against the dark, which, which really does not end well for them. Does not end well at all, because later on, after John leaves the Fist, the Night's Watch are attacked by an army of zombies, of whites, and most of them get murdered. So, um, there's... It, it, maybe it was a bad idea. <laughs> maybe fighting the darkness was bad. Maybe they should have stayed home, and that's how a lot of the Night's Watchmen feel about this place. Uh, so, John and Jill Mormont and the Night's Watchmen go up to the top of the hill, and John's direwolf ghost really is not happy about being here. He like he keeps trying to run away and go back down the hill, and John keeps saying, "Come on, mate! Come on, doggo! You know, yip yip! Come on, c come up the hill with me!" And Ghost keeps like turning tail and leaving again. Um, something seems to be spooking Ghost. Ghost doesn't like the smell of this place, of this hill. And so that sort of foreshadows the fact that these the zombies are attacking here um, soon. I mean, not super soon. It's still like it's still like a dozen chapters away. I mean, it's really at the end of the book. It's it's it is at the end of this this giant fat book that the whites actually attack. It's still quite a long way away. Um, so it might not just be about the white attack. That might not be the only reason why Ghost is being weird. Because the other thing that's going on here is that somebody has buried a cache, a, a sack, if you will, of uh, dragonglass and obsidian and a mysterious old horn. There's a, there's a bunch of very important artifacts that are buried down the bottom of this hill. And it seems as though Ghost, or some 
mystical three-eyed crow, mayhaps, is influencing Ghost to guide Ghost to bring John to uh, the Dragonglass Cache. Um, so so th- there's a lot of sort of th- things going on here. There's a lot of mystical forces lurking. There's the incoming zombie attack. There's whoever planted this cache of dragon glass. It might have been Benjen who did it. It might have been Cold Hands who did it. It might be Benjen is Cold Hands. We'll get to that. Um, so and, and so there's all that happening. And, and above, you've got the red comet. Because remember, throughout A Clash of Kings, there is a bright red comet streaking through the sky for, for weeks and weeks and months. And everyone has different opinions about like what this mystical comet means. The Lannisters choose to believe that it's Joffrey's comet and it's Lannister Crimson. And, and the Night's Watchmen choose to believe that it's Jor Mormont's torch and it's leading the Night's Watchmen. But... um. Others say that it's associated with magic and magic returning and the dragons being reborn. And some people theorize that the Red Comet, the coming of the Red Comet, is connected to the White Walkers returning after all these years. And I like that idea. George R. R. Martin wrote a bunch of uh, other sci-fi novels, um, some of which were called the Tough Voyaging, about a, a funny fat man with a cat and a spaceship. And uh, one of the tough voyaging stories, they're gonna they're gonna adapt tough voyaging to a series of graphic novels. So I would like to make some videos and live streams about tough voyaging, um, especially once the graphic novel is out. But in one of the tough voyaging uh, novels, the Plague Star, one of the stories, the Plague Star, it's about this uh, star, this this light that that orbits in this long elliptic orbit around this planet. And when the Plague Star passes close to this planet, evil, horrible plagues and diseases break out on the planet and everyone dies. So there is this seasonal, cyclic, returning apocalypse that occurs uh, whenever this light, this plague star, appears in the sky every X number of years. And that seems very similar to the Red Comet, doesn't it? It's this it's this light that appears in the sky every now and then, and, and when it comes, magic rises, darkness rises, bad stuff happens. So... I I think there is a connection absolutely between between the Red Comet and the White Walkers, and we can go into all the Azor High stuff, cracking the moon open, and Nissa Nissa, and all of that. We'll 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 get to it. Slow down, hang on, folks. Thank you. So anyway, um, so Ghost is being weird. They're going up the hill, uh, and. They get to the summit, the top of the hill. Ghost just runs away, and John's like, fine, whatever, like, do what you want, doggo. Um, and so they get to the top of the hill, and at the top of the hill, there is a wall, a ring wall of, uh, of old, weathered grey stones, bearded with green moss and white lichen. Uh, and it's a chest-high wall made of stone. Um, oh, there must be locust coming. Um, and so there's this there's this wall. This is a fortress of the first men, um, and it mentions that Jor Mormont's raven, the bird, is like cawing loudly and complaining uh, because you know Jor has this pet raven, which a lot of people suspect is controlled by Blood Raven. And so I wonder if you know when this raven is making a racket, is it also trying to tell John, hey, come and get this dragon glass cache down at the bottom of um the hill like i think there's great like high comedy in imagining blood raven way up north in his cave is like trying to influence the direwolf ghost and the raven jaws raven trying to get them to get john to follow them down to the cache it's like the it's like herding kittens you know like blood raven is trying to get a teenager to follow a dog to uncover some treasure and it's obviously a difficult process he does not have great control over this menagerie of animals this motley menagerie that he's trying to lead many miles away down on the fifth um but anyway so they go up the hill they find the fort and uh this is an old place an old place and strong says thorin smallwood one of the ravens because one of the rangers because this was a ring fort of the first men in the dawn age and later on like samuel tarley says "Ooh, like i wonder like what kinds of battles were were fought at this ring fort like what was this fortification for and it's a good question, isn't it? Like, why did the ancient humans of this place build 
this fort. It would not have been easy to get all of those big ass grey boulders and drag them up to the top of this hill, stack them into this giant ring wall. Like, why was it so important that they defend this particular place at that particular time? It's not like this land seems to be very valuable, like it's just this forest. This is in the far north, like it doesn't seem to be like good farmland or anything. The wildlings don't seem to make much use of this particular land. Like, what? why is this fortification here? Was this fort built by humans to fight against humans? Or was this fort built by humans to fight against White Walkers, maybe? I've also seen uh, theories. Some people think that this fort was built by the White Walkers as a trap for the humans. Like, trying to draw the humans into this fort so they're easier to kill because they're all in one place. Like a little mouse trap for, for men. A man trap. Um... Which I think kind of makes some sense because like this fort does not work very well Like a bunch of times throughout this chapter and other chapters the Night's Watch keeps saying man What a great fort the F fist of the first men such a such a strong place such an easily defensible place But as soon as the zombies turn up the whites turn up they get steamrolled like in 0.5 seconds They just get spanked by the zombies It's a bad day because like the zombies can climb right up the hill They can climb right over the walls and and they talk in this chapter about how you can't see enemies approaching from the top of the hill because the enemies are cloaked by the by the forest, the dense forest down below and the darkness. You can't see shit from up on this hill. So you're not really very safe up there. You're more vulnerable in this fort, you know? So, I mean, I don't know, like, was this even a military fortification or was this more of a just a cultural place or a religious site maybe i don't know maybe maybe the first men conducted blood sacrifices here maybe the first men worshipped the weirwoods here maybe the first men maybe this is where the white walkers were created like you know in the tv show when they created the first white walker by like stabbing like tying him to a tree and stabbing him with dragon glass i don't know maybe, maybe this is where the night king came from there is no night king in the in the TV show, in the books, sorry, um, but but you know the White Walkers had to cre had to be created somewhere. Maybe this is where it happened. I don't know, and maybe that's part of why Ghost is so freaked out by this place. They also mentioned that the Ranger Dywin is freaked out by this place, and the Ravens are freaked out by this place. This is a bad place. Something bad happened here. Maybe. You know, it's all very spooky, and I think that even at this point, even all these years later, it's still it's still a bit mysterious why everyone is so freaked out um, by this particular place at this particular time. Um, I, I, I think that, like, I, I, th I think that the most likely explanation is that people are freaked out because Cold Hands is here at the bottom of the hill burying the Dragonglass Cache right now. I, I think that's probably why everyone smells the cold and all this weird stuff is happening, but... We will discuss that further as we get along. Anyway, so... Uh, so... Um, Jewel Mormont growls at his, at his raven, who is being noisy and annoying. Um, and Mormont was too proud to admit to weakness, but John was not deceived. The strain of keeping up with younger men was taking its toll. So, you know, Jewel Mormont is this older guy. He's the leader of the Night's Watch, and he is the one who said, yeah, we're going to take most of the Night's Watchmen, the strongest Night's Watchmen, we're going to go north, we're going to fight wildlings, white walkers, fuck them, we'll, we'll, we'll take them on. Mano y mano, let's do it. Um, and and some people, including Night's Watch, some, some Night's Watchmen think that's a terrible idea. Like, in the next John chapter, Chet says that this this is an old man's folly. You know, Jill Mormont just wants to have one last great, proud adventure mission before he dies. Um, but it's not a very smart mission, you know, because like if like like the Night's Watch is at its strongest at the wall They are the watches on the wall. The wall is kind of their thing the, the wall is their biggest advantage and Jor Abandoned their biggest advantage by leaving the wall if he wanted to find out what the wildlings are up to Send Corrin Halfhand and Jon Snow and Jarman Buckwell and all the scouts. Send the scouts into the Frostfangs, sure. But taking the bulk of the Night's Watch's strength away from the wall to get them slaughtered out beyond the wall is a pretty bad idea. Because even if they, even if the White Walkers didn't turn up, even if the White Walkers didn't attack the Night's Watchmen, 
the wildlings would have slaughtered them, you know? Because, like, because their plan, Jor discusses the plan. His plan is let's hunker down at the Fist of the First Men because it's a defensible, strong place, and let's wait for Mance Raider's army to come, and then we'll fight Mance Raider's army at the Fist of the First Men. Do you think that would have gone well for him? I don't think so. Like, they say in this chapter that, like, yo, Jor, we are way outnumbered by the wildlings. We are 300 dudes. The wildlings have thousands of dudes, tens of thousands of dudes, including giants and cannibals and wargs. Some of the elephants, some of the mammoths have wooden towers full of archers on them later on in the book. Like, it's like an oliphant situation. Do you want an oliphant situation, Jor? Because that's what you're going to get. You're going to get an oliphant situation all over your ass. That's is a bad idea. This whole ranging is a terrible idea. So I kind of agree with Chet. I don't like to admit it, but I kind of agree with Chet. This mission was a bad idea. Anyway, um, so Thorin keeps insisting, oh no, this place will be really easy to defend. It mentions that Thorin wears a sable-trimmed cloak, because Thorin is one of the more upper class of the Night's Watchmen, and he has more fancy and expensive clothes, which is, you know, one of those things about the Night's Watch. Like, Benjamin Stark tells John that, you know, the Night's Watch is a meritocracy. People get what they earn. Everyone's equal according to their merit, according to their ability. Except we learn throughout the book, so that's not really true. Like, some people get certain advantages by being highborn, by being knights. Um, they get better gear and fancier clothes and they get higher status and more power within the Night's Watch. Like, usually the commanders and the high-ranking officers are highborn people, not lower-born people. So, like, the, the lie of the Night's Watch mer meritocracy is an important detail. Uh, John points out that, like, hey, like, we're at the top of this hill. Okay, cool. It's It's got a fortification. Great. But John points out, where are we going to get water? Uh, there is a brook, a stream, uh, at the foot of the hill, but John points out that it's a pretty long climb to, to climb all the way down this steep hill to get some water and then walk all the way back up. And that's outside the fortification, so, so maybe this isn't a great place to camp at the top of this hill, maybe we should stay near the water. Um, but Thorin's like, are you too lazy to climb a hill? And Jor's like, nah, whatever, we'll just carry water up, it'll be fine. But, but the point is that Jon Snow, in the books, is someone who, like, has strategic ideas. He makes observations, he notices things. So something that they emphasize a lot in the first book about Jon is that Jon is perceptive. He sees things, he notices things that other people don't notice. Um, and they kind of dump that in the later books, honestly, because, like, John becomes almost, like, willfully blind to certain things in the later books. Like, in book five, John is not very observant. John does not notice that, like, his brothers are plotting against him. Like, if John was more observant, he might have avoided his assassination. He might not have got stabbed by his men at the end of that book. Like, like John is kind of willfully blind uh, in book five, whereas in book one he's described as more perceptive. But but the other thing is that like you know throughout all the books, John is someone who comes up with good ideas. He notices things. He has a strategic mind, um, and that's something that they emphasize in this chapter as well. Like they like John talks to Jill Mormont, and they're talking about Benjamin Stark because John's uncle Benjamin recently disappeared, and John and Jill want to find Benjamin because you know he's a competent dude and a cool guy and a Stark, so they want to get him back. Um, and John says, "Well, how how are we going to find Benjamin if we're just staying at this fortification?" And then eventually, and and Jill says, "Hey, come on, like Maester Amon thinks you're smart. Figure this out, John." And then John thinks, and then he's like, "Oh, I get it." We're staying at this fortification because we're, we're visible up here, so Benjen will see us. Instead of going and finding Benjen, we can draw Benjen to us by, by being visible at this fort. Um, and so, so the, this chapter really makes a point of, like, John is meant to be, like, an intelligent guy who figures stuff out and, like, has a strategic mind. And we definitely see that throughout, like, you know, the battles against the wildlings late in book three. John comes up with a lot of smart ideas, like filling barrels with ice and rock to drop onto the wildling battering ram. And throughout book five, John comes up with all these solutions to, like, figure out, like, getting food and, and finance from the Iron Bank and, like, politics, like, marrying Sigorn to Alice Karstark. Like, like John, John, John in the books is someone who is smart. He's a strategist, he's a leader of men, he's thoughtful, he's perceptive. 
Um, and that's very different to John's portrayal in the TV show, right? Like, in the TV show, Kit Harrington is an action star. He's always running around, stabbing wildlings, doing flips, you know, get, getting, getting busy and dirty with the, with the zombinis, you know? That's what Kit Harrington's all about. Jon Snow, not so much. Jon Snow, in all of the books, in all of the published books, guess how many people Jon kills with his sword. Like, in the in the TV show, Jon must kill dozens of people with his sword, right? Like, it would, it would be at least 20 or 30 people with his sword. Like, there are so many battle scenes in the TV show where Jon is just fuel, 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 like a goddamn Jedi. Not to mention all the zombies and the whites that Jon kills. Uh, whereas in the books, all of the published books, he, here's John's kill count. One, he kills Othor, the zombie, in book one with fire. In book two, he kills Corrin Halfhand, but Corrin Halfhand let him kill him. Like, Corrin let John kill uh, Corrin, and Ghost helped. Uh, and then in book three, John kills either two or three wildlings at Queen's Crown one of whom was killed by a horse, uh, and two of whom he, like, slashed at them with his sword. Uh, yeah, it's like between two and four wildlings he kills at, at Queen's Crown. And then at the battles at the wall against the wildlings, he kills some wildlings with arrows and stuff, um, but he only kills one wildling with his sword at the battles at the wall. Uh, and then in Book 5, John doesn't kill anyone at all. There's no hard home fight for John in book five. So, so the so John's like total total kill count uh, in all of the books is is something like five or six. I mean, if we include like all of the arrows that John shot from the top of the wall during the battle, he probably killed a bunch there as well. But if you talk about with his sword, it's like four or five guys total. Whereas in the show, it's a it's a bajillion. It's a bajillion. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, Carmelo in the live chat reminds me that yeah, John also kills uh, the wildling Orel with his sword in book two. That's that's true as well. Um, so it, it's something like five dudes that he kills with his sword, which which is so different, isn't it, to the TV show where he's just cutting down hordes of redcoats all day. John is only like a sixteen-year-old boy in the books, so he's not like a huge fighter or a warrior he's more of a strategist he's more of a thinker he's more of a leader that's the point that i'm trying to make uh, but but in book five and in book four and in the end of book three john makes a point of training to try and become a better swordsman um so and he trains against this guy iron emmett who's like one of the best night's watch swordsmen so i i think that george martin is setting up for for john to become a really great warrior later on uh, but that hasn't quite happened yet i think that john will need some cool sword skills for like the end game of this story when he like defeats the white walkers or whatever towards the end but but he, but he's not there yet uh, so the Night's Watch make camp at the top of the Fist of the First Men. They put out their tents and their blankets and bedrolls and axes to get wood and digging latrine lines and all of that fun logistical stuff. And Jill Mormont commands that all of the gaps in the ring wall uh, will be ditched and staked and fortified. So they're doing a really good job of defending this fort to its uh, as best they can. And that helps them... Not at all. It, it does not save them when the White Walkers attack, and I don't think it would have saved them if the Wildlings got to them either, so it is all, it is all pointless. Um, and then John is hanging out up on the thing, uh, up in the fort, and then his direwolf appears. Suddenly, one moment, John was alone in the green, and then the next moment, the great white direwolf was walking beside him, pale as morning mist. Ooh, it's almost supernatural, isn't it? Ghost seems kind of ghostly. Ooh, interesting. There's a lot of weird ghost stuff going on in this chapter, which I think reinforces and supports the idea that Ghost is being warged or being influenced by Blood Raven, the three-eyed crow far further up in the north, trying to make John find the Dragonglass cache. Um, Oh yeah, sorry, he's outside the ring fort right now, and as they walk back into the ring fort, 
Ghost stops again, and Ghost the direwolf sniffs warily at the gaps in the stones, and then retreats as if he did not like what he had smelled. And John tries to actually, like, drag Ghost into the fort. Like, John tries to pick up Ghost and drag him inside, but the, but the Ghost is... Uh, is is as heavy as John is and far stronger than John is. Ghost is big. Ghost gets bigger and bigger. The direwolves get huge in the books, and that's part of why they sort of marginalize them in the show, because apparently the dogs and the CGI are just kind of a pain in the ass. And also the TV show just didn't like the magical elements of the story and just took out the magic cool stuff. But yeah, the uh, the books are very much about the, uh, the magic doggo pets. Um... And uh, and so John thinks that, well, we should be safe up here uh, because there's these, you know, we can see all over the forest and, you know, it, it, there are these walls and it's all great. Yet John's sense of foreboding grew. This is the haunted forest, he told himself. Maybe there are ghosts here, the spirits of the first men. This was their place once. So it's like, ooh, super spooky, super tense. Um, and the whole, you know, the stuff about the first men is important because the Starks are first men. Like, like, like the the ethnographic history, the cultural history of Westeros is that originally there were the children of the forest and the giants. They were the only people, the only humanoids in Westeros. And then the first men walked across the land bridge through dawn to Westeros, and the first men were the first humans in Westeros. And then the Andals turned up. The Andals are these blonde, blue-eyed conquerors who come in and take over Westeros, and the Andals eventually intermarried with most of Westeros, and Andals became like the dominant culture in Westeros. It was the Andals who brought knighthood and and steel and all of that, uh, whereas the first men worked bronze and, and they worshipped the old gods. Um, and the first men were defeated in basically all over Westeros except for the north. The north is like its own cultural zone, be partly because they resisted the Andals better than the other kingdoms did. And so the Starks are the first men still. They have the blood of the first men. And the wildlings are the same. As Yigret told John in the previous book, the wildlings and the Starks, they are of the same blood. They are the same like ethnicity. They are the same cultural roots that they have. And that's sort of the, the tragic irony of the conflict between the North and the Wildlings because, you know, they are divided by this wall and they've been fighting each other for thousands of years, but like they are the same people. It's just this arbitrary wall that divides them when really the Wildlings and the Starks and the Northmen arguably have more in common than the Northmen have with the Southern Kingdoms of, of the Riverlands and the Reach and the Vale and all of that. So it, it's this sad irony that this conflict even exists. But the, the other reason why I bring this up is that the, you know, the world book especially um, talks about how the first men and the ancient Starks were dicks. Like, they were these tough, harsh, scary warlords. Like, the Starks have been in charge of the North for thousands of thousands of years. They are an unbroken dynasty. Like the pharaohs, like the pharaohs of Egypt. The Starks, the Starks have ruled the North for longer than the uh, pharaohs of Egypt ruled in real-world ancient Egypt. Um, I think, if I've got my history right. Um, which is crazy. And the Starks did not do that by, like, being nice. Like, like the Starks have not retained their, their dynasty for that long by, like, giving people cookies. They did it by, like, brutally suppressing re rebels. Like, the, the world book, the World of Ice and Fire lists all of these rebellions that the Starks brutally put down, like the Warg King and, and the Barrow people and the Marsh King, all of these people that the Starks subjugated, you know, um, violently. And so when John in this chapter is thinking, ooh, the spirits of the First Men, this was their place once, like it kind of makes sense that, ooh, like this was a place ruled by harsh, strong, violent warlords. And those violent warlords are John's ancestors. And they are the wildlings, like, blood cousins, you know? 
And then, of course, there's the idea that what if the ancient Starks intermarried with the White Walkers, and there are certain hints that maybe the Night's King uh, might have been a Stark, and the White Walkers and the Starks might be related, as well as the Wildlings are related. So this is all this, you know, there's all this stuff about this ancient blood, you know, this ancient conflict that is still there in the bones of this place. A Song of Ice and Fire, in my opinion, like the central theme of A Song of Ice and Fire is intergenerational conflict. It's showing how, you know, the, the sins of the father are passed down to the son. And that's very evident in relationships like uh, Tywin Lannister's relationship with Tyrion Lannister and Tywin's father, Tytos, you know, and, 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 the, and like the entire story of A Song of Ice and Fire happens in the shadow of Robert's Rebellion. Um, that that Robert's Rebellion was the previous generation's war, and we see so much about how like the echoes of that war affect people today. We we see how the trauma and the loss and the death that like you know Ned Stark suffered with the deaths of his family in Robert's Rebellion affects him now and informs the conflict that happens in the contemporary War of Five Kings. And like even before Robert's Rebellion, the previous previous generation. We see how, like, Barristan Selmy has been shaped by, like, the War of the Nine Penny Kings, and, like, Tywin and Littlefinger and and the, some of the Lannisters, and, and like, all, all of that generation of people w w were forged in the Nine Penny Kings Rebellion War. Um, and, and I think it goes back and back and back. Like, Tyrion has a line. It goes back and back to our fathers and their fathers and theirs before us. We are all puppets dancing on the strings of, like, the previous generation. And I think it goes all the way back. I think it goes all the way back to the First Man, to the Children of the Forest, to the White Walkers. Because what was revealed in the TV show is that the White Walkers were created by the Children of the Forest to fight against the humans, to fight against the First Man. Um, and that's, like, the original sin, you know, like the original sin of that conflict, that horrible war between the humans and the children of the forest, that is what created the White Walkers. The White Walkers are a consequence of that terrible violence. And now that, now, now that, that the memory and the aftershock and the ghost of that terrible violence is the White Walkers. And now they're coming back. It's the past coming back to bite everybody in the ass. It's the ghost of the past haunting the present. I think that's what the White Walkers are partly. That's how they connect. That's how the supernatural White Walkers connect to the very grounded and real theme of intergenerational violence in the present. And I think that's what John's feeling now, you know? Like, he's standing at this ancient fort where, you know, brutal first men chieftains fought against other humans, fought against children of the forest, fought, fought against White Walkers. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Like, whatever, whatever that war was, it was bloodshed that seeped into the stones, and John can smell that blood here and now, and it's a part of him, and it's in his blood, and he's continuing the wars of today. Because, of course, Jon Snow's arc is about this war with the, with the wildlings, and Jon learning and learning and learning that, like, it's, it, this war should not be happening. This this war against the wildlings should not be happening because we are the same blood, and there's good people on both sides, and there's bad people on both sides, and the only thing that should really matter is, is that we are the living, and the living must oppose the dead. It should, the living should not fight the living. And I think that Jon's arc is, is leading up to him uniting the living against the dead and and trying to find peace and trying to find reconciliation because the only way to find peace is not by fighting the living it's by opposing death itself that's the only thing we should fight like george martin has some wonderful lines where he talks about um he talks like, like he gets accused of cynicism like a lot of people see game of thrones and a song of ice and fire as like a pessimistic cynical story um, and someone asked George Martin about that in an interview, and he agreed. Let me let me quote him. I think I've got it somewhere. Um, yeah, George R. Martin said in 2013, quote, But I don't necessarily think it makes it a pessimistic world, not any more pessimistic than the real world that we live in. We're here for a short time, and we should be conscious of our own mortality, but the important thing is that love and compassion and empathy with other human beings is still possible. Laughter is still possible, even laughter in the face of death, the struggle to make the world a better place. We have things like war, murder, and rape, horrible things that still exist in the world, but we don't have to accept them. We can fight the good fight. There is darkness in the world, but we should not despair. We should not go gentle into that good night. So winter is coming, but light the torches, drink the wine, and gather around the fire. We can still defy it. 
that's that's like the thesis statement you know like there is a lot of darkness there is a lot of horror in a song of ice and fire but the purpose of the darkness is to give meaning to the light and that is how it's going to end up i think and john is struggling to to find and to protect that light anyway that was a bit of a tangent so John is on the Fist of the First Men with his direwolf ghost. Ghost is sniffing a pong that he does not enjoy. And so Ghost leaves. And John feels foreboding and fears the spirits of the First Men, but he tells himself, ah, it's nothing, it's fine, we're safe here, whatever. Um, and he looks out at the horizon and he sees the mountains, the frost fangs, the cold and inhospitable jagged peaks of the mountains. And he's going there. He's looking at that mountain. He's going to go there later with Cor and Halfhand and the scouts. He's going to go out there. But closer, all around the fist of the first man, it was the trees that ruled. To the south and east, the wood went on as far as John could see, a vast tangle of root and limb in a thousand shades of green, with here and there a patch of red where a weirwood shouldered through the pines and sentinels. A thousand leaves fluttered, and the forest seemed like a deep green sea, storm-tossed and heaving, eternal and unknowable. So, in this chapter, like, repeatedly, the, the trees seem alive, the trees seem malevolent, and it specifically mentions weirwoods, multiple weirwood trees. And weirwood trees are, of course, connected to the old gods and the children of the forest, which we later find out created the White Walkers, at least in the TV show. Um, so, yeah, I think that reinforces this idea that, like, this is a place where bad violence happened, and the White Walkers are the product of that war and that bad blood. Um, so John is experiencing the consequences of that horror. Um, and so we continue when Sam comes up and chats with John. And John says, how you going, Sam? How did you do today, Sam? And Sam said, well, I, I fared well, truly. Because, you know, John, John is aware that Sam is not built for adventuring. Sam would really rather be back at Castle Black eating some pork pie and reading a good book right about now. Um, uh, Sam has been brought out here anyway, though, because Sam is literate. He can uh, manage the ravens. He can draw maps. So he, he's been brought along on that ranging, even though he is terrified and he is not really well equipped for this. And John is John is is sensitive to that. And John shows a lot of care for Sam's needs. Sam is says, John is very sweet with Sam. He's really nice throughout the books. He really really pays attention to how his friends are going, and it's very lovely. It reminds me a lot of um, Frodo and Sam. Like, like the, the heroes of The Lord of the Rings, Frodo and Sam, are, of course, um, there's a lot of parallels with the heroes of Game of Thrones, John and Sam. Because um, Sam, in both cases, is this sort of attentive, supportive friend to the main hero, uh, John or Frodo. John and Frodo are both sort of carrying a heavy burden and they both sort of internalize their pain and 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 sam is the more sort of normal well-rounded well um, well more well-rounded sam is well-rounded um no but like Sa sam is supportive of john slash frodo who who is carrying this burden and is sort of the central hero and sam is the supportive secondary character very similar uh but anyway so uh sam says that uh the the old bear jaw mormont wants us to wait here until Corin half hand arrives because Corin Halfhand is this legendary badass Night's Watch Ranger from Eastwatch from the Shadow Tower from the Shadow Tower uh, who is bringing like a hundred more men to join up with them uh, and the name Corin is misspelled in this edition of the book and in and in the official ebook edition there's actually like a bunch of typos that are still in these books that haven't been corrected even in versions still being sold today which I think is hilarious like if you're a book publisher what what are you doing? Like what what is your job as a book publisher if not to like make sure there's no typos anymore? Like 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 really? Come on! Like they should fix that. Anyway, uh, so they talk about the battles that might have happened here, and Sam talks about the ravens that he is tending, and he says, "Oh, these ravens hate being stuck in these cages." And I like how you know Sam is showing empathy towards animals because Sam is is very sweet and sensitive as well, which is lovely. Um, and it mentions John, John's burned hand. John burned his hand when he killed the zombie Othor in the previous book, and he often flexes that hand to keep his burned fingers working and, and, and limber. 
Um, and, and whenever he does that, it's also like a subtle reminder of the White Walkers, of the zombies, uh, which are, of course, looming in this chapter. Uh, and it mentions that comet, the red comet we talked about, which is burning as bright as the moon, which is an interesting thing. Uh, you can you can look into the symbolism of of the torch and the moon, like it you, it could uh, evoke like a Zora High and Nissa Nissa and all of that astronomical symbolism and the idea that you know uh, Zora High killed his wife Nissa Nissa and the idea that the sun burned the moon and that's what created dragons. That's a story that we're told in the books, like the sun and the moon created the dragons, and now we are looking at. A comet that burns as bright as the moon. There's interesting. There's some interesting stuff there, uh, but it seems it seems to John as though the ravens are also freaked out. Like jo like John is freaked out. The ravens are freaked out. Ghost is freaked out. And then later on, the ranger Diwan says that he can smell cold. And John thinks, oh, the the smell of cold. I smelled that when I fought the zombie Othor. So so it's there's mul like there's there's multiple hints that there are zombies around here there is the smell of zombies around this hill and that's part of why everyone's feeling freaked out and that's part of why ghost is acting weird and so the question is okay like what what is everyone smelling like like who farted like what what happened okay what's going on why is everyone spooked and like one possibility is that it's because the zombies are coming and the zombies are going to kill them all but like i said the zombies don't actually turn up until the end of this book like it is it is like 400 pages away yeah it's 400 pages away that the zombies actually turn up and attack um so wh what why is everyone freaked out now and i think the answer is that they're not actually smelling the zombies and the whites they're smelling cold hands. And cold hands in the books is this uh, mysterious hooded zombie figure who is working for cold, uh, who is working for Blood Raven, it seems. And cold hands saves Sam and Gilly later on. And cold hands guides uh, Jojo and Mira and Bran and Hodor north to the Three Eyed Raven's cave. Um, and yeah, cold hands is undead. He's a zombie. Uh, he, he smells cold. And I think that Cold Hands is here right now, burying the cache of Dragonglass and the Horn of Winter. I think Blood Raven got Cold Hands to, to, to put it there so that John and, Night, and the Night's Watch would be armed with Dragonglass to fight the White Walkers with and would have the Horn of Winter to protect the wall. I think that is the... I think that's the real reason why everyone's freaked out. They're not smelling the evil zombies, they're smelling Cold Hands. Um... And so it's ironic that that in this chapter later on, uh, Jill Mormont and John talk about let's try and find Benjen. Uh, if Cold Hands is Benjen, then Benjen is here. <laughs> Benjen is here right now, burying the Dragonglass cache. I think. And so it's hilarious that so they're like, "How are we going to find Benjen?" And Benjen is like a hundred meters away, putting the Dragonglass cache. Now, of course, like in the Cushing Library in Texas, there are a bunch of manuscripts early manuscripts of this book written by George R. R. Martin and in these early manuscripts there are notes between George and his editor Anne and Anne wrote in the margins ooh is Cold Hands Benjen because it's a mystery who Cold Hands is because he wears a mask over his face and 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 George Martin replied to Anne and wrote in the margins no um so a lot of fans are like, well, okay, there you go. Cold Hands is not Benjen. George Martin said so. But, like, the more I read these books, the more I think George was either trolling or wrong or changed his mind. Like, like because, like, when they talk about Benjen later on, the three-eyed... The, the, the raven, who may or may not be controlled by Blood Raven, says, dead, dead, dead. Like, they talk about Benjen, and, and Jill Mormont says, oh, you know, I hope he's okay, but it's possible that Benjen Stark is dead. And then the Raven says, dead, dead, dead. So, like, it, it seems like they're sending a very strong message that Benjen Stark is dead. And if Benjen Stark is dead, it makes sense that he's Cold Hands, because Cold Hands is this undead monster. And in the Game of Thrones TV show, Benjen is Cold Hands. Like, they played the same role, basically. So, I, 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 yeah, Fry in the live chat says that George just doesn't, didn't like that we guessed. Maybe George just hated his editor. Yeah, I think George was trolling or just misinterpreted something. I think Benjen is Cold Hands. Like, it, it just makes sense. It just is cool. Um, I like it. So, I think, I think it's true. I like it, so I think it's true. That's how logic works. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, where are we? So, uh... John is chatting with Sam, and then he goes and sees Jill Mormont, because John is the steward, the servant of Jill Mormont. 
Uh, and so what that means is that he has to do a lot of uh, little menial labor. John has to build a fire and uh, he pours some wine and he makes some hot wine for some mulled wine, some spiced wine for Jill Mormont. And uh, Jill Mormont was very particular about his hot spiced wine. He wants exactly a certain amount of cinnamon and so much nutmeg and so much honey and not a drop more. Raisins and nuts and dried berries, but no lemon, which was the rankest sort of southern heresy. But he does put lemon in his morning beer. So, like, it's hilarious that Jor Mormont, this, like, you know, tough military leader, is such a princess about how he wants his drinks made. I find that quite funny. Like, like Jor is just, like, this old man who wants his comforts, you know? Like, he wants... He's like an old man who sits in his particular comfy armchair, and that's his spot, and he wants everything to be a certain way. We, I'm sure many of us know old people like that. And it's like, fine, like, like, like be like that, Jor. But if you're gonna be so particular, don't, like... Don't go on a military expedition. Don't go on such a ill-advised military expedition if you want to be all comfy all the time. Like, come on, pick a lane, Joe. Pick a lane. Anyway, um, so I like that John does this sort of menial work because it makes John humble. You know, like in the first book, especially. We saw a certain amount of arrogance from John. Like, John was occasionally like, I'm better than you guys, I'm such a good swordsman, I'm such a good rider, so I should be a ranger, I should do adventures, I should do cool stuff. Uh, but, he, but, he, but he accepts a more humble role as a servant to Jor. Like, he's literally, like, washing the guy's clothes and shit. Like, John is doing very unglamorous work. Which, again, they didn't do that in the TV show. In the TV show, we never see John making Jaws drinks or cleaning his armor or whatever. But I think that humility is really important, you know? Because cause A Song of Ice and Fire finds the nobility in humility, you know? Like, like A Song of Ice and Fire is about questioning the whole idea of noble men being better than others and this hierarchical feudal nonsense. And, like, it, like A Song of Ice and Fire really champions people like... Davos and Brienne, who are unpretentious and practical and respectful, and a lot of the worst characters are people like, you know, Tywin and Joffrey and, and all these people who think they're better than everyone else and think that they're, you know, of a higher rank. And so I think it's important that John finds humility and, and is able to serve others and is self-sacrificing and is not so arrogant as to think that he's too good for doing menial labor. So I think that's really nice. And also, of course, like, you know, as the steward to the Lord Commander, he's being groomed for command. And, like, th this is how you do that, right? Like, if you want to be a part of, like, some fancy, big, high-ranking organization, you start by being the coffee bitch, right? Like, you are the one who fetches everyone's lunch orders at the office, and it's by being there and doing the menial tasks in the margins and in the background, that's how you learn and you meet people and you, and you observe how real business is done. Like, if you're at some office, you start at the very bottom, you, you start as an, as an assistant, and then you work your way up and you gain experience by starting low-ranked and then rising. And that's exactly what happens here, because, like, while John is making the wine and, and serving people and, and handing stuff out, he overhears all of the conversations between the Lord Commander and the other high officers as they discuss strategy. And so, you know, Jarman Buckwell is saying that, oh, you know, we could... We could march into the mountains to go and confront the wildlings, but the wildlings will see us coming. Uh, and then Jor is like, yeah, no, nah, I, I think we should stay here on the Fist of the First Men. And then Otten Withers is saying that, no, nah, I don't think we should go. We should go home. <laughs> we should leave, guys. We should Xbox 360 and, and walk out the door. Uh, and Otten Withers is completely correct on that count. If, if they listened to Otten, Otten wouldn't be dead. Otten gets um, hit in the face by a horse hoof. Uh, later on in the next book. So uh, I, I feel for you, Otten. I feel you. We, you guys should leave. But anyway, John successfully makes Jor Mormont's drink correctly. Uh, Jor gives a, uh, a brusque nod of approval to John. So recipe, recipe success. Good job. It's like cooking mama or something. Um, and the raven keeps going on about corn, corn, corn. Uh, and so they're discussing strategy, and yeah, Sir Malador says the obvious truth, which is that what the fuck are we doing out here? We've only got 300 dudes, and the wildlings have thousands. We're fucked. 
Uh, so yeah, Jor is not not very smart. Jor Mormont says that, well, if it comes to battle, we could not hope for better ground than here. The Fist of the First Man is strong and will improve the defenses with pits and spikes. And it's like, Jor Mormont, my dude, y y you have the wall in the south, the biggest wall in the world. That is the better ground. That's where you should be. But anyway... Um, and Jaw says, oh, don't worry, you know, we'll have scouts and we'll hide them in the trees. And also we're going to dig some cisterns. It will keep the men occupied and may prove needful later. Jaw Mormont is literally having men dig toilets that they may or may not need just to keep them busy. Can you, can you believe that? What a shit boss. Hey, sir, build a toilet. Get out of my hair. Go build a toilet. That's what I should say to my children next time they're being annoying. Go and build a toilet, Clive. Get out of my living room. I'm trying to watch the races. Next page. Uh, so they're talking about strategy and they're making a bad one. And Jill Mormont says, look, we, we know that the wildlings are in the frost fangs because Krasta told us so. And the mystery that they're trying to solve is, is, is why are the wildlings gathering in the frost fangs? And what we find out later is that Mance Raider is trying to find the Horn of Winter, the magical artifact that destroys the wall. Uh, and ironically, uh, Man Mance does not find the Horn of Winter, but in the cache of Dragonglass that John is about to find uh, is a little horn. And a lot of fans suspect that that little horn is the Horn of Winter, the real Horn of Winter. And at this point in the story, Sam Tarly has that horn in Old Town. And some people think that Euron Greyjoy might end up getting that horn and blowing it and destroying the wall. I think that would be cool. Unlike in the TV show where Viserion, the, the, the zombie dragon, just like burned a hole in the wall. I, I don't think that's what's going to happen in the books. But we shall see. Uh, and Jewel Mormont feeds his pet raven some corn, um, and yeah, as I as I said, we uh, Jewel Mormont uh, gets John to figure out that they're staying on the fist so that Benjamin Stark can find them, and so they're emphasizing that John is smart and can figure things out. Um, and while Jewel Mormont does this, while Jewel Mormont is sort of testing John, uh, Jewel Mormont's pet raven. Uh, tilts its head to the side and and watches John. Its little eyes are glitter. So I think that it's possible that Blood Raven might be controlling the Raven at this point and is watching John and watching John being tested. And then they talk about Benjen and the Raven says, dead, dead, dead. So yeah, I, I think that Benjen is dead. I think that Benjen is probably Cold Hands. And I think that Cold Hands is burying the Dragonglass cash right here. I think George Martin says that he's not. I think George Martin's wrong. George Martin's wrong about his own book. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, and anyway, so John leaves Jill Mormont and uh, he hears distant laughter and the plaintive sound of pipes. A great blaze was crackling in the center of the camp. Uh, and, and he can smell the stew cooking. So, like, it kind of sounds like that the, jo the, the Night's Watch are having a nice party, you know? they got a nice campfire, someone's playing music. Like, like they're just rocking out. And I think I, I love that for them. Like, the TV show mostly showed the Night's Watch as being no fun. Like, the food never looks good in the TV show. They're never, like, partying. They're not singing. They never sing. They're, they're not, like, having a good time. But in the books, like, they absolutely do emphasize that the Night's Watch, they, they party, you know? They have a good time. They have music. They have food. They have drink. The food's pretty good sometimes. Um, Night's Watch, you know, there's no women, um, and it's cold, but, you know, they party. Uh, so anyway, so, you know, that's when uh, the ranger Daiwan, who has no teeth, he has wooden teeth, uh, uh, he has these he has these clacking wooden teeth uh, and Daiwan is this very experienced ranger and Daiwan says hmm there's something bad out in the forest it smells cold I think that's because of cold hands is out there and also Dolorous Ed smells that uh, says that the stew smells like horse shit uh, which is very unkind to the chef um, and John gets sort of a bit upset and freaked out um, and he gives his stew to Gren, who looked in need of an extra supper. Again, John is looking after his friends. You know, John is so considerate and sensitive, and he gives his dinner to Gren, and that's lovely. John is, John is nice to his friends, and I like him. Uh, and then because John is sort of feeling a bit uh, upset, a bit scared, a bit stressed, a bit worried about zombies, uh, he goes off on his own and sits, sits on his own for a bit. And that's a tendency that John has throughout the books. He, like, when he's stressed, he tends to isolate himself, which I think is a bad idea. I think it's a bad idea because uh, isolating himself is part of what ultimately leads to John's 
death and assassination uh, in the fifth book uh, because he sends his friends away to other castles and he gets left alone surrounded by enemies and he gets no help when he needs help and he gets killed. So uh, I think John's tendency to like be a loner and to be and to brood alone and to be an emo, I, I think that that is one of John's weaknesses. I think that he should instead rely on his friends and reach out to his friends when he is stressed and needs help. Uh, so John sits out there and looks at the stars overhead and the dark forest, and he hears wolves howling, and it's 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 a chilly song and lonely. And so I think that reminds us of like the Stark dire wolves, um, John's half siblings, wolves who are all scattered and separated from each other, and it's um, really it's really sad, and it makes John feel lonely because it reminds us of how John and the Starks are separated and isolated from each other. And then across the fire, a pair of red eyes regarded him from the shadows, which is such like a wonderfully like cartoonish image, you know, like, like, like the red eyes on the black background. That's such a great classic cartoony sort of an image. And again, it makes Ghost seem very creepy and it seems as though Ghost might be possessed by Blood Raven at this point and it's all very... Ooh. Um, and of course, you know, Ghost is connected to the old gods, like John several times notices that Ghost's red eyes and white fur is the same as the red weirwood leaves and the white weirwood bark and the old gods magic. And so, you know, to the extent that the old gods and the trees are sinister and connected to the White Walkers, Ghost is also in some sense sinister and connected to the White Walkers, you know, it's, it's all, it's all interconnected. Um... So John's like, ah, Ghost, Ghost has actually turned up inside the fort, um, and Ghost is still uncertain. Ghost, Ghost is sniffing around, sniffing the cold, sniffing the undead on the air, uh, and John remembers how Ghost, it was Ghost who led John to Othor back in the day. Um, and so John is thinking, ooh, Ghost must be smel smelling zombies right now. And then Ghost walks off, and, and John realizes he wants me to follow. So John follows uh, Ghost, he follows his dog out into the dark, and there's a guard who says, yo, what are you doing, John? We're meant to stay here. And John says, oh, I'm just fetching some water for the Lord Commander. And the guard says, fine, go past. So John lies. Jo jo John is willing to lie, if need be. Like, he, he says in book three, he tells Sam that, yeah, I think it's okay to lie if it's for a good reason. Um, so, you know, I, I think that the TV show, especially, like, later on in the TV show... They present Jon Snow as being this, like, inflexibly honourable, honest person. Like, in the later seasons, Jon, like, refuses to ever tell a lie and refuses to ever break a promise. But I think Jon in the books is more complicated than that. Jon, Jon, Jon always wants to do the right thing. And Jon would, like, prefer to not break his oaths and would prefer to not break his promises and would prefer to tell the truth. But he absolutely does lie and he absolutely does break vows. Like, he has sex with Ygritte, he pretends to join the Wildlings, but he doesn't. Uh, he he swaps the babies um, in in the end of... at the end of book three, at the, at the start of book five. Um, he, he's separ he swaps Gilly's baby with Dalla's baby. Like, like Jon absolutely lies, cheats, and steals when he has to. So he's he's a lot more complicated than Kit Harrington in the Game of Thrones show. So anyway, um so so John is making a terrible decision here because like he's he suspects that there's zombies out there and he suspects that ghosts can smell zombies and instead of like getting some backup and telling his friends, he decides to go off into the dark by himself. John John is that's a terrible idea. And again, like, that's that's John's flaw. Like, he always wants to face the danger himself. He doesn't want to endanger anyone else. And so he just ends up putting himself in, in bad, dangerous situations. He is, like, self-sacrificing to a fault, you know? So he leaves the fort and he goes down the hill in the dark, which is very dangerous because, you know, all the rocks and the roots, he could easily, like, trip or break an ankle or break his neck. Uh, but they go down there. And then we get more description of the trees, the trees seem even more sinister and malevolent because the trees stood beneath him, warriors armoured in bark and leaf, deployed in their silent ranks, awaiting the command to storm the hill, just as the zombies do eventually storm the hill from this forest. Branches clutched at his cloak, while overhead thick limbs twined together and shut out the stars, 
So the trees literally make it dark, you know, as though they bring the long night, as though they bring the darkness. So all of this, again, like we, we were told before, there are weirwoods in this forest. So again, this like connects symbolically the trees and the weirwoods and the old gods to the White Walkers. And the show tells us that the White Walkers were created by the children of the forest with the magic of the old gods. So, so there absolutely is like supportive, indirect, but supportive evidence that uh, in the books as well, the White Walkers were created by the children of the forest with the magic of the old gods. And John and Ghost are connected to that magic because they are of the first men, because they have walking magic. They, they, I think the Starks, I think John may have White Walker blood through the Night's King. Anyway, um, so Ghost looks really weird for a moment. Like John orders Ghost to come to him and Ghost disobeys John. And Ghost raises his head, and his eyes glowed red and baleful, and water streamed down from his jaws like slaver. There was something fierce and terrible about him in that instant. And then he runs off, and the ghost and Ghost continues to disobey John. So like John's it's like something is going on with Ghost right now. The text is very clear that Ghost is acting weird and he seems scary and his eyes are red. So I, I think that I think that this is like the strongest hint that we get that Ghost is being influenced by Bloodraven. Bloodraven, the three-eyed crow, the mystical tree wizard who who teaches Bran in the far north, I, I think that he is influencing Ghost through warging magic, because we know that Bloodraven is a very powerful warg. Uh, I, I think that Bloodraven is controlling Ghost to lead him to the Dragonglass cache. Although what I think what, what I think is, is hilarious about this moment is that while Bloodraven is controlling Ghost to lead him to the cache, Ghost stops for a drink, and he goes, pff, 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 and he drinks from the stream, which is like, oh, hang on a minute. Like, is Bloodraven thirsty? <laughs> is, is is Ghost thirsty? Like, like Bloodraven wants to achieve this magical mis- mis- mission for the safety of the realm, but he's also, like, stopping to, to, to hydrate. Like, I know that hydration's important, but why is he doing that right now, you know? Like, of course, Bran... Uh, eats through summer like when Bran takes over summer's body like summer eats animals and and Bran experiences what it's like to eat through summer so maybe Bloodraven's having the same experience which I I just find it funny that like Bloodraven's stopping for some some of the old H2O while he's trying to lead John Uh, so John uh, is annoyed and he's chasing his pet through the woods I'm sure many of us have experienced trying to chase down a, an, an errant pet that's running off and causing mischief um and uh there are all these rocks and roots that seem to grab at his feet which again makes the trees seem sinister and malevolent as though they're attacking john trying to stop him uh and so he chases ghost like quite a long way around the fist for the first men when he comes across ghost he, ghost has finally stopped and he's digging he's digging and digging at this spot and this is where they find the dragon glass cache um the soil is loose whatever whatever was here had been put here recently and so ghost like starts digging it up uh and then john like starts starts getting down and looking at what is in there and Ghost sits and watches. So it's very it's very clear. It's very clear that Ghost is deliberately, purposefully leading John to this thing. Ghost knew it was there. That's what's going on here. Um Blood Bloodraven was controlling Ghost like a like a remote control submarine with an Xbox controller. Um, which must have been <laughs> difficult to do. It's like leading lemmings. Controlling a dog to control a teenager down a hill. What a what a nightmare. Um and so Ghost, uh, and so John uncovers what is in the cache, and he finds that uh, in a in a cloak is a bunch of dragonglass weapons, a bunch of obsidian knives, spearheads, arrowheads, and he thinks, oh, was this buried here for thousands of years? But then he realizes, no, the black cloak that it's wrapped in uh, is is damp, but it's not rotted. It could not have been long in the ground. So I, I think that it is possible that this cache was literally buried like hours ago by cold hands cold hands was here burying this cash out moments ago and that's why all of diwan and the ravens and ghost and john are smelling this this undead stench it's because of cold hands and ironically cold hands may be benjen and they're searching for benjen and benjen is right there like like the ironies i i just find too good to not be true you know and so among the dragonglass daggers there is also an old warhorn um, and John doesn't think much of it, and no one really takes much notice of this war horn. John just gives it to Sam. But I, I, a lot of fans believe, and I believe, that this horn is probably the horn of winter, the magical horn that can 
um, bring down the wall that Sam now has in Old Town. Uh, and John notices that this black cloak, uh, it's the black cloak of a Night's Watchman. And that's how the chapter ends. It's like, ooh, whose cloak is this? And like, come on, it's got to be Benjen's. Benjen is, is the, the missing ranger that everyone's been worrying over for ages. It's probably Benjen's black cloak. Although, now, now that I say that, I, I just realize now, like, like if that is Benjen's cloak, and if Benjen is Cold Hands, then where is Cold Hands's cloak? Like, if Benjen is Cold Hands, did Cold Hands give his cloak to wrap up this dragon glass cache? And is there. Does, does Cold Hands still have a cloak? Because if Cold Hands still has a cloak and there's a cloak here, then maybe it wasn't Cold Hands who put it there. I, I, the descriptions of Cold Hands, it says that Cold Hands wears, quote, mottled blacks and greys. I, I might have to look up some more if Cold Hands has a cloak. I don't remember Cold Hands having a cloak, but but if Cold Hands does have a cloak, that, that would be weird, wouldn't it? Because where did he get this other cloak that he buried the dragon glass in? But if Cold Hands doesn't have a cloak, that does support the idea that, that Cold Hands gave up his cloak in order to wrap up this cache. Although Cold Hands, like... We don't know how old Cold Hands is. Like, some, like I, I do like the idea that Cold Hands is Benjen, but some people theorize that Cold Hands is actually, like, the first Night's King, or Cold Hands is, is Aegon the Fifth Targaryen with, with, with covering his horrific burns from Summer Hall with, with, with black clothes over his face, or, you know, Cold Hands is, is fucking Rhaegar. There's a, lot, there's a lot of theories about who Cold Hands is, and some of the ideas are, are that Cold Hands is, like, truly ancient, like that Cold Hands is hundreds of years old. And, like, I, I kind of enjoy those ideas as well, but, um... I, I think Benjen is um I think Benjen is my preferred theory at this point. In the TV show, it's not uh John who finds this dragon glass cache. It is Sam with the help of Gren. Um which I think is like kind of lame because if the cache is connected to Benjen, Sam doesn't have any connection to Benjen. Sam doesn't know Benjen. Uh Benjen is John's uncle, so I think it kind of makes more sense for uh, John to find the cache. Al although, you know, admittedly, it, it is Sam who uses one of the dragon glass daggers from this cache to kill a White Walker uh, in the next book. So, I, so I guess he has a connection to this as well. I guess that's fine. I don't really know why that change was made, Sam instead of John. It just gives Sam something to do, I guess. I think the show was trying to give Sam more to do. Uh, but anyway... Um, so, yeah, they found the cache. Good job, John. You finally did it. Uh, and in the next chapter, John is going to go off with Corrin half-hand and go scouting for the wildlings. And then the rest of the Night's Watchmen, or most of them, are going to get slaughtered by the army of zombies that's about to arrive. Um, so, yeah, John's in a spooky ghost story. Uh, there is much ominous shenanigans going on about him. Uh, John is trying to be smart with his strategies. He's learning from Jior. He's learning to become a better leader. I think this is all preparation for when John becomes Lord Commander of the Night's Watch himself in the third book. Um, that's what it's kind of leading up to. And John is experiencing the mysteries of the White Walkers and the First Men and the ancient history that he's going to confront later on in the story. Uh, and it's all uh, it's all a Yahoo yeehaw good time, I think. Um, I think uh, I will respond to your super chats and donations now. Thank you, everybody who kindly gave donations using using the link in the video description or super chats. Those are all great. Thank you very much. Um, and of course, remember that you can subscribe to Alt Shift X on YouTube. You can also listen to this show on Spotify or any podcast app. There are links in the description so that you can subscribe. To, on the podcast, on the Spotify. You can also follow on Twitter. YouTube has a habit of not notifying people about these live streams. Um, so you might want to turn on Twitter notifications for Alt Swift X because I always tweet before we do one of these live streams when I remember. Uh, so yeah, like and subscribe and follow the podcast. All right. Uh, so yeah, that was that chapter. I think it's pretty cool, smart, real. Let's answer some super chats. So, thank you for the super chat from Sir Alt Swift Flowers. Dear Father, thank you for the gift by post of our, <laughs> of our ancestral blade, Swiftfire. 
I'm honored to lead our forces against the bastards of Glidus. Yes, we don't want those uh, Gl- Glidus barbarians uh, encroaching too close onto the uh, Swift lands. Uh, so I, I trust Swift flowers that with our noble Valyrian steel envelope opener, Swift fire, <laughs> my Valyrian steel crab fork, Swift fire, will be sufficient. Uh, to assist you in defeating the ravening hordes of House Glimbus. Um, so yes, g- good work, my bastard son. Alt Swift Flowers. Uh, thank you, Sonny, who says you bring so much joy. Thank you for being you. That's very kind, Sonny. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jason Hall, who says first person to derail Swifty gets a cookie. I-, I think I was pretty on the tracks, like uncharacteristically on the tracks today. Um... So, uh, so, so go us. Hugo says, what do you reckon the prologue of winds will be? I I think there's a lot of compelling theories about, um, so the Lannisters are planning to transport, uh, Jane Westerling, who is pregnant, uh, west to Casterly Rock? Is she pregnant? I forget. The, the, taking her west, and I think there's a lot of theories about like Brynden Blackfish might like spring her, uh, li- li- might like free her from the Lannisters and, and and take her back, and like like I I forget the details off the top of my head, but there's a, there's a lot of cool theories about that. Uh, personally, I would enjoy a Hodor prologue chapter in which every word is Hodor. I think that would be fun. I, I think a prologue set in Old Town would be cool because there's so much cool stuff happening in Old Town with like Sam and Alaras and Euron. Although we did just get a Feast for Crows uh, prologue chapter in Old Town. Um, I, I, I think that I think I think that what makes a lot of sense is a ghost prologue chapter, actually. Because, you know, John in the in the previous book, in the latest book, died and his last word was ghost and there's a lot of very strong hints that in the books john will uh his soul will go into his animal ghost which is a thing that can happen um so i i think that having ghost the first word the title of the prologue chapter ghost would be extremely cool and getting to see like what like where is john's consciousness at uh, when he's when when his murdered soul is inside his dog, and like we've seen from Varamir's chapters, like how a warg's spirit and personality can be altered by being inside its animal, and like like the human mind and the animal mind get merged to some extent. Like I I think that would be very cool to have a ghost prologue chapter. Um, so that's a good option. Uh, thanks for the super chat from JJ Bones, who says, I can't believe the Winds of Win... I mean, a Game of Thrones abridged is here. There is a legend that the day that a Game of Thrones abridged is completed, uh, the Winds of Winter will come out. Um, I have heard that said. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Saint, who says, Big fan of Ghost being weird. I love animals with personality disorders. What can I say? Thank you, Sandy, who says, You're one of my favorite YouTubers to eat snacks too." Thank you for being you. Which POV chapters are your favorites to read? Uh, I think Tyrion is always fun because Tyrion has great snappy, funny dialogue. Um, John John is often one of the less like dynamic and exciting personalities to read. Like 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 he's kind of a bit more one note. Like I think he's a good character, but he like definitely tends to be just oh I've got to make such a hard decision oh it's real tough being Jon Snow and it's a bit like yeah okay Jon uh Victarion is is funny in his you know brutality um Arya is so plucky and she goes through so many varied adventures um but yeah I think Tyrion might be the most fun uh, so Altshift Flowers says, Father, it today the day you accept me? Uh, look, uh, my bastard son, I have given you my Valyrian steel crab fork. Um, and what more acknowledgement do you need? Nikolai says, Swift for president. Thanks for the super chat from Thomas, who says, Do you think Brian Herbert will make a series of novellas based on the adventures of Dunk and Teg? <laughs> uh, that, that is a deep cut joke for the uh, Dune heads out there. Uh, Miles Tegg is one of the characters in the later Dune books. 
And Brian Herbert is the son of Frank Herbert, who wrote some much maligned sequel books to the original Dune books. And Duncan Egg is, of course, George Martin's uh, novella series about Duncan Egg, which uh, is being made into a TV show. It's It's got a series order, a season order from HBO, and, and that's happening. So I'm excited for that. Thank you, Marcella Deliveria. And thank you, Metatexture, who says, You'd love Berserk. Ever thought about reading it? Yeah, I've had Berserk recommended to me a bunch, and I, and I would like to read Berserk or watch Berserk. Uh, I, I did see a little... I did watch a little bit of the episode with, with the God Hand and the whole um, situation that happens there, and, and my, my goodness, uh, it's, Euron, it's Euron Greyjoy's wet dream, that episode. Um, so, yeah, I would like to check out Berserk. It seems like a cool and dark and scary and intense and mystical story. I don't know if I have the time to read an entire goddamn manga, though. I, I would probably just watch the anime. Thanks for the super chats from Trasma and No Soy Radel, who says, Do you think Euron's crow's eye will die? If so, how? I think that the most poetic and appropriate death for Euron crow's eye is to be destroyed by his own delusions of power like like to be consumed by his own uh ambitions like you know dalla says that the horn lord said that sorcery is a sword without a hilt there is no safe way to grasp it euron greyjoy is grasping magic as as hard as he can he 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 has no fear he is just jumping headfirst into magic you know like like he said like you know how will we know if we can fly unless we throw ourselves out the tower euron is throwing himself out the tower and you know blood raven shows bran that there are dead bodies impaled on ice spikes representing people who have reached for magical power and failed uh, i think that you know there's a lot of speculation that euron's blood sacrifice uh, with the red wine fleet will like summon a Cthulhu drowned god monster from the depths. There is there is evidence supporting that, really, because like there is talk about how Krakens are drawn to the surface by blood. Like I think it is likely that we will see sea monsters summoned by Euron's atrocities. And I think that if Euron got eaten by one of those sea monsters, it would be A hilarious and B thematically appropriate. So why would George not do it, you know? I think that another thing that could work, actually, come to think of it, is uh, I I've seen like folks like Paul Quentin theorizing that Euron might blow the Horn of Winter from the top of the High Tower, the tallest High Tower in, in the tallest tower in Westeros, which I think is a great idea. What if Euron then fell from that tower? What if Euron was fucking struck by lightning at the top of the High Tower, like a lightning rod? That would be cool. That would be rad. I would love to see Euron struck by lightning at the top of the tower and then falling to his death like Icarus, you know? Stealing fire from the gods and being punished for it. Blammo. You know? Like, he, he he's trying to seize power from the gods themselves. He's trying to defy the gods. And so if he got destroyed by some kind of divine power, that, that would be appropriate. Like, I don't, you know... My point is, I, I don't think it's enough for Euron to be fucking shivved by Jamie Lannister on, on the shores of King's Landing like he was in Game of Thrones Season 8. Like, that was... Y Euron Greyjoy is nothing in um, in the Game of Thrones TV show. He's a totally different dude in the books, and he's totally more scary. Thanks for the super chat from Tywin, who says, It's 1.26am in Indiana. Just got some Taco Bell. Been drinking Mike's Harder Lemonade. So drunk right now. Hell yeah. I'm getting bitch a stream. Thanks, Tywin. Uh, <laughs> have fun tonight. Kaylee says, Absolutely love these videos, but at the rate you're going, wins will be out before you finish. Honestly, I'm not all that worried about George catching up. It's it's like a race between a sloth and a snail, you know? And honestly, whoever gets there first, we all win. Whoever wins, we are all the victors. If George releases wins, great. If Old Shrift X finishes Game of Thrones Abridged, great, you know? And if we got to the end of Game of Thrones Abridged, we could just do, like, Duncan Egg Abridged or, you know, the Fire and Blood Abridged. You know, we're not going to run out of material anytime soon. Uh, but it would be cool to do these more regularly, wouldn't it? That Maybe, 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 maybe. Thanks for the generous super chat from Evan, who says, Take my money, you glorious person. Thank you, Evan. Scarlet says, Wait, walls. Watch is Border Patrol. John is a cop. 
Yeah, hashtag ACAB, my dudes. Yeah, no, so John is a cop. John is John is a Border Patrol cop. John is on the on the wall at Texas keeping uh, people out from the South. That That's what's going on here. And, like, A Song of Ice and Fire does not, like, hide that fact. Like, A Song of Ice and Fire is, like, even more uh, explicit, I think, than the Game of Thrones show is about the fact that the, the wildlings are refugees. Like, Mance makes it very clear in Book 3 that the wildlings aren't trying to conquer the the seven kingdoms i mean some of them are but the main reason why all the wildlings are uniting together and coming south is because the wildlings have been displaced from their homes by the white walkers and so they need to leave their homelands they're forced to leave their homelands and they're forced to try and move into this uh land for sanctuary they're trying to come south for sanctuary and the night's watch is stopping them and, and they're the border agents stopping them and, and you know locking them up in season five the wildlings are kept in like cages and, and they're fucked around and they're kept in this bureaucratic limbo and you know there absolutely is like contemporary political commentary happening i think about about real um refugee issues and border issues that happen all over the world all throughout history um and 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 you know the wildlings are not only refugees they are climate refugees it is the winter like the white walkers are embodiments of the winter and this this changing climate is what forces them to move so um yeah wh whether you whether you enjoy contemporary politics in your fantasy books or not i i think that george martin is doing that to some extent and 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 you know the books two and three are about john realizing oh maybe i shouldn't be a border patrol cop like maybe this is not the ethical thing to do um but of course you know he also recognizes it's it it, it would be terrible to let you know rattle shirt and harmer dog's head and all of these brutal raiders uh through the wall into the seven kingdoms to cause havoc and some of them he assumes are good people so you know it's all it's complicated there's a lot going on here thank you for the super chat from alt swift rivers my bastard son who says doth my ear nubs deceive me father continues his ponderings on ancient texts after losing my legs in the war i never thought i'd see the day well look alt swift rivers you may not have ears and you may not have legs but at least you still have eyes with which to see this glorious day thank you springborn who says there's a fantasy series i want to abridge someday how would you feel about someone nicking your abridged format do i have your blessing cheers uh, Springborn, I did not invent getting drunk and talking about books, so you are very welcome to abridge uh, whatever books in this style. You have my blessing. Have fun, and, and go. everyone check out Springborn's channel uh, to go and watch their videos. Thank you, uh, Alt Shrift Flowers, my other uh, bastard, who says, Hello Rivers, my favorite half-brother. I'm glad you guys are getting along. I'm glad you guys are getting along. Not not all of my children get along, so I'm glad that you are. Thank you, Righty, who says, My first live abridged. I listened all the way through at work over the past couple months. Really helps me focus with my ADHD. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer Crow, who says, I started Lord of the Rings, and now I'm craving a Swift and Glumbo song slash poetry review stream. Hello from Florida. I mean, that's not a bad idea, because Glidus is a musician who knows music things and i'm a uh, swift who knows swift things so surely by our powers combined we could do some excellent uh grade school music analysis type content that's what the people need uh yeah no we're open to suggestions though if everyone if anyone has like silly things that they would like uh me and glimbus to watch and comment on uh, suggest it. I've heard a lot of people saying that we should check out Silo. Silo is a new TV show that's a sort of a mystery box uh, type situation, uh, vaguely reminiscent of like Lost or Snowpiercer or something, based on a series of books. Um, I, that would be fun, wouldn't it? If if Glidus and I watched Silo and um, commented on it together in some live stream, that would be fun. I'll, I'll, we, we should do that. Thank you, John Braxton, who says, thank you for being here. You helped me get through my university finals. Stay safe. Thank you, John. Good luck for your university finals. Stay safe yourself. Thank you, Rainy, who says, love your stuff. Thank you, KCX Stealth, who says, thoughts on the upcoming Avatar The Last Airbender TV show. Yeah, so I watched Avatar The Last Airbender for the first time recently, 
and I thought it was great and I, and I wish I had watched it earlier and it, it is obviously such a wonderful show it's just so much better than it needed to be you know like it could have been just like a mindless kids cartoon but it really does have so much thought put into the character arcs and the world building and just just there's so much love and care that goes into avatar the last airbender i I love all the little hybrid creatures there's so many critters like the platypus tortoises and the and the duck rabbits and all these funny little critters in avatar I, th- there is so much to love about avatar the last airbender and you if you haven't seen it and if you're looking for some kind of like fun upbeat ya cartoon I, you can't get much better than avatar i think um as for the netflix live action tv show yeah i mean like it doesn't seem like a good idea to me <laughs> like avatar is great the way it is and 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 it's great because it's a cartoon because it's an anime like like it uses the strengths of its medium in so many ways with a lot of the sort of cartoony hijinks that happen and a lot of the styles and the expression like it it, it works It, it, it it's fine don't fix it it's not broken and I mean, you know, all that said, like, you know, a reimagining could be good. It's not impossible for it to offer some new perspective and, and, and be great. But, um, you know, there have been so many mediocre live action adaptations and shows and remakes, you know, The Lord of the Rings and The World Wheel of Time. And uh, does the world need an Avatar live action TV show? I kind of doubt it. I, I've also seen those um, stills. They've released some photos of what the characters look like. And it's like, yeah. I, I guess that's what they would look like in live action, but like I I prefer the original personally. But you know, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna judge a show that hasn't come out yet. I don't know. I hope it's good. Uh, thank you very much for the donations from PPP and Dag Hagmark and Owen Doc and Carl. Carl says, "Is Longclaw Dark Sister?" Dope as hell. Love the content. Um, is Longclaw Dark Sister? So Dark Sister is one of the ancient Valyrian steel Targaryen ancestral swords. Dark Sister was wielded by Visenya Targaryen, and it was wielded by King Maegor Targaryen, and it was wielded by Blood Raven. And George R. Martin, uh, at a convention, said that Blood Raven brought Dark Sister with him to the Night's Watch according to Ashea of History of Westeros. Everyone should go check out History of Westeros and should thank Ashea for asking George Martin such a great question, because it's not often that George Martin actually answers a fan question and actually tells us something that we didn't already know. It was very exciting to find out that Bloodraven had Dark Sister. Um, And so, like, I guess since Dark Sister is confirmed to have been at the Wall... And since Jor Mormont gave Longclaw to John at the Wall, I, I I guess we could speculate that maybe Longclaw is Dark Sister. Maybe Jor took the old Targaryen Valyrian sword that was sitting around and decided for some reason to uh, change change its appearance and claim that it's actually Longclaw. I, I mean, I, I think it's impossible because da- Dark Sister is referred to as being a like s- a smaller, slender Valyrian sword designed for a woman's hand because you know it was wielded by Visenya, the queen. Um, and yet, Longclaw is a bastard sword, which in A Song of Ice and Fire means that it is. Uh, a bit larger and a bit longer than a usual one-handed sword. So I, I think because of the size difference, it doesn't make sense for Longclaw to be the same sword as Dark Sister. Um, also, that would have to mean that Jor Mormont like lied about where the actual Longclaw is, because Longclaw is a real House Mormont ancestral sword that's been around for hundreds of years. So, like, I guess, like, the idea would be that the real Longclaw is on Bear Island, which, like, kind of makes an inkling of sense, because, like, isn't it weird that Jor Mormont gave away his family's ancient ancestral sword? Like, wouldn't his family be annoyed about that? Wouldn't Mage Mormont be annoyed that Jor gave away their family's birthright sword, you know? Um, so, so no, I, I don't think that Longclaw is Dark Sister, but, I, but I do think that Dark Sister will appear at some point. A lot of people think that Arya might have Dark Sister, might wield Dark Sister. And I like that idea because Arya is literally a Dark Sister. You know, she's become this murderous, um, badass, scary killer, um, 
and you know john makes a comment about how a a swordsman should be as good as their sword and aya has become a, a better killer and so maybe she needs a better sword you know like i mean needle is a wonderful weapon ne- needle is wonderful and needle is so sentimental because john snow gave needle to aya and needle is like a symbol of their relationship and so i think it could actually be really powerfully symbolic if aya lost needle somehow and so she was like and that would that would be Arya losing her identity. I mean I mean Needle is stolen from her uh and then she gets it back and then she has to hide it again like 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 you know Arya has like like lost and then regained and then put aside Needle multiple times already and, and that represents that symbolizes Arya losing touch with her stark identity losing touch with her humanity. So I think if Arya lost Longclaw lost Needle for good and never got it back that would represent Arya permanently losing part of herself and part of her humanity and part of her connection with with her family as a stark and and i think that absolutely is the theme of aya's character arc it is all about how aya's experiences Arma's trauma aya's induction into a literal death cult has made her less human and i think losing needle would, would represent that and so if she loses needle she'll need a new weapon and dark sister would be pretty fucking sweet for Aya to have because like I mean you know people people meme on the whole like Aya being a, being like a Marvel superhero in Game of Thrones season 8 like like I think that they did g- lean too hard into Aya being like this invulnerable ninja um and and I, and I don't think that Aya will be the one to defeat the white walkers in the books but Aya still absolutely is a an absolute beast killer, nasty shadow ninja warrior assassin, and so I think it would be sweet if she had Dark Sister, so maybe that will happen. Maybe she'll come to the wall to get it. Aya has talked about wanting to come to the wall and reuniting with John, so it's possible. Uh Owen Doc says Swifty versus Alt Shift X cage match. Uh, look, I, I I am this close to challenging Alt Shift X to a rap battle, and I, I think we all know who would win uh, if I did. Thank you for the super chat from Haveldorf, who says, There is a pink beef swelling in my a cock. I feel my mouth open, holding, clinging to my mast-shaped girder of abridged. I fucking love the deep cuts, guys. There are some references that I think two percent of the of the viewers understand. You are you are combining the cringiest sex descriptions in A Song of Ice and Fire with the cringiest descriptions in Dune with the cringiest cringe of a cock abridged. My my goodness, what a what a what what sweet melange of strange mouthfuls you've made me read. There you go. Thank you, Raven, who says, incredible seeing another episode. Love what you do. Uh, Connell says, how will John's leadership style change following his resurrection? Will he be more trusting? What choices could he make to show him as a better leader? Well, look, look, John, John is a pretty good leader in like books one, two, three, because he... He is sensitive to other people's needs. He is perceptive and he sees the strengths and he sees the good in others. And he finds ways to elevate other people and to give them opportunities to succeed. So he does that with Sam by identifying Sam's strengths and putting Sam in a position where he can succeed and be useful. And he does that with Saturn where he identifies Saturn's strengths and takes Saturn under his wing and, and grooms him for command. And and, and so John, John is really good at doing that especially in the earlier books i think john's weakness as a leader comes in book five when he becomes a bit more uh insular a bit less communicative and a bit less 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 caring about what other people think of him like he just tells people how it is and he just kind of bulldozes and steamrolls over their concerns which arguably was necessary you know to to save the wildlings and everything but like it does not work out for him and he ends up being stabbed to death so so his leadership style and his communication style fails in book five i i think that what might happen um in future books is that john john like the last thing that happened before john got stabbed is that john received the pink letter from ramsey or from mance rega uh he receives the pink letter and then he's like you know what screw this i'm leaving the night's watch i'm killing the boltons i'm saving Arya, if you will um 
and that that is that is what happens immediately before John gets killed. And, and I think that you know if we look at the other Stark who's been resurrected, Catelyn Stark, when her last moments were moments of like anguish being killed by the phrase and seeing Rob killed by the phrase. So when she's resurrected. She's resurrected as a revenant of revenge, as like this vengeful, hateful ghost monster who just wants to hang Freys until there's no Freys left. Like that is Stoneheart's deal in the books. And so I think like if we use that as a model, I think it's quite possible that John will be resurrected and he will become someone who is similarly more vengeful, more hateful, more violent. Um, and so if he sort of retains that impulse that he had in his last moments in book five he might direct that anger and that rage against the boltons and he'll ride to winterfell and help stannis kick the boltons and the phrase asses i think that's entirely possible i think it's also possible that you know as in the tv show john will kill the men who killed him so in the show it, it's it's alice thorn and i think bowen marsh and ollie he hangs them um i think that he may kill them perhaps even more brutally in the in the books I, I think that he may change physically i think that like stoneheart like stoneheart in the books has red eyes she has burning hateful red eyes that look like burning pits and i think that um john if he's resurrected and he has red eyes that would not only mirror stoneheart's eyes but that would also connect to ghosts red eyes and the old god's red eyes and melisandre's red eyes because melisandre has red eyes and it and it's melisandre who resurrects john at least in the tv show so i think red eyes there's like four different ways that, that red eyes would be symbolically appropriate for resurrected john stoneheart ghost melisandre and the weirwoods so i i think that john may have red eyes i think he may also have white hair because Stoneheart has white hair after a resurrection, and Theon has white hair after he is symbolically reborn as Reek after his trauma, so maybe Jon after his trauma will get white hair as well. And that would be thematically appropriate, not only because Ghost has white hair, but also because Rhaegar, Jon's true father, has white hair. So, you know, a lot of people clown on the idea of, like, anime Jon with, like, white hair and red eyes, like, that would look a bit cartoony maybe but like there's a lot of thematic reasons why that would be cool so like to answer your question connell i think that john will probably be angrier more violent he will probably leave the night's watch because you know like it shall not end until my death the night's watch vows and john will die so he will be freed from his vows when he dies i think that that made sense in the tv show so i think john's getting out of dodge and he's killing some boltons and i think he'll be angry and violent and i think that that can't last forever because you know john's so much of John's character is about being more, you know, gentle and, and listening and making peace. Like, John is meant to be a conciliator, not a killer. So so I don't think that this, like, vengeance spree will last forever. I, I wonder if, like, I don't know, Daenerys will play a role in, like, helping John find a more peaceful side, even though Daenerys is also on a violent rampage right now. It's like in Archer rampage mode mode. Like John and Daenerys will be on their rampage mode mode in the Winds of Winter. But I think they've both gotta like cool the hell down uh for a dream of spring. So Yeah, look, it, it's complicated. John's got a lot to do. I think he'll do some I think he'll do some killing. Um, but I think that ultimately John will return to heroism and he will return to himself and he will ultimately sacrifice Daenerys to to get the magical power to defeat the White Walkers. I think that is probably what will happen. I think that Jon may journey north to the heart of winter and to like destroy the White Walkers at the source. In the Game of Thrones TV show, we saw um, this tree and this like spiral formation of rocks, which is where the White Walkers were originally created. Um, there's and I, I think John journeying north like the last hero with with his companions and his dog and, and doing something there might be part of it million possibilities uh, thank you Alex Petev and yeah happy birthday Yoni again hope you're having a good one uh, Scubert says what if John just grabbed Ghost's snout and shook it that always fixes uh, animals it's like a reset button um you have you have to hold down the, the 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 nose and and waggle the ear and then the the dog resets like an iphone haveldorf says that cold hands is tywin for hands of gold are always cold there you go irrefutable 
uh, book evidence that Coltans is in fact Tywin Lannister. I mean, look, we've never seen them in the same room, so it's possible. Um, Olivia says that we have a copy of a note of George Martin's editor asking if Coltans was Benjamin and George saying no. Yep, that's true. Uh, in that in that library in Texas, um, I I have seen that, and I think George is trolling or wrong or changed his mind personally like maybe maybe it's ridiculous of me but i i still think that coltan's being benjamin makes so much sense and i would be shocked if they weren't the same but you know maybe the winds of winter will come out and prove me wrong thanks for the super chat from daniel and from conal who says what will the white walkers ultimate fate be peace or destruction seems unlikely if wildlings head north p.s your streams put me to sleep yeah, I, I think that the White Walkers will be destroyed, and I think that that will make the inconsistent seasons become consistent again. I, I think that like this, this, this cycle of violence, this cycle of the long night and, and, and the intergenerational violence has to cease. I think, that, I think that will be the resolution of the series, and I think there'll be great destruction and devastation, but I, I think that they will destroy the White Walkers in the end. Because partly of John and and Daenerys's death, probably. Um, I think that's all part of it. Thank you, Sir Alt Swift Flowers, who says I was knighted by Lord Bronn the Honourable of Highgarden and will rally the Reach to your cause. That was certainly one of the most D and D moments of Game of Thrones season eight when they decided to make Bronn the Lord of Highgarden. There is a zero percent chance that the that the Lords of the Reach would accept Bronn as the Lord of like the most prosperous and knightly and like high status and fancy wancy uh, of of the kingdoms there's no way they would accept the cutthroat up jumped bron as their overlord bron would get assassinated in about five minutes into his uh, rule of the reach in my opinion carl kang says do you think stannis will survive an attack on winterfell by the others um I think that Stannis will kick the Boltons and the Frey's ass uh, with the whole night lamp theory, using a using a lighthouse to lure the Frey's and Boltons onto rotten ice and to destroy them. I, I think that the White Walk, uh, like I, I think some people have theorized that you know Stannis will hold Winterfell and he will be besieged by the White Walkers, and he will sacrifice Shireen. Uh, to try and get the power to defeat the White Walkers, uh, but I think that he, he will ultimately die. Um, it's possible that Shireen's death might be what resurrects Jon uh, as part of some sort of ritual. That's possible. Because I, I do kind of like the idea of Jon being resurrected at Winterfell, because like the Winterfell crypts, he has all these dreams of the crypts and all this stuff about uh, waking a dragon from stone. I think resurrecting Jon in the crypts might be waking a dragon from stone that that prophecy um but you know i i think stannis is doomed to die like i i don't think he's gonna go out like a chump in the way that he did in the game of thrones tv show but but i think that stannis is a tragic figure and um i, I certainly don't think he's azora high so i i don't think he'll beat the others there, there's some interesting parallels between you know john between stannis being potentially besieged at winterfell and Stannis being besieged at Storm's End by the Tyrells in Robert's Rebellion. I, I think what that might play out again. Scubit says, have you read Blood Meridian? I have not. I also love Ghost. Deeb says, missed your Song of Ice and Fire food stream. Wanted to point out that fermented mare's milk uh, tastes like a mix of goat cheese and sparkling water. You say that like it's a good thing? Like, I've seen some people roast me and Gladys in the comments saying that fermented mare's milk and fermented goat's milk is actually super great and good look i'm yet to be convinced honestly I, goat cheese and sparkling water does not sound great to me but i i i, I, won't, I won't yuck your yum and i won't knock it till i tried it maybe it's great uh ENTX says a chance of a video on Silo. Yeah, I said that Silo looks like an interesting show, and and yeah, I I would like to do, I I would like to watch Silo, and I would like to do a live stream about Silo, maybe with Glidus. Thank you for the super chat from Aho. Who are you calling Aho? 
who says, Do you think George R. R. Martin can't finish the story because it would force him to face his own mortality? Like maybe his identity is too entangled with A Song of Ice and Fire. Look, I, I think that George R. R. Martin absolutely is a tortured artist, and I think he absolutely is caught up in his feelings about A Song of Ice and Fire, and I think that he doubts himself, and I think that he's like, is it good enough, and this is my legacy, and oh no, the show got past me, I'm a failure. I, I mean, like, George Martin says that Sam Tarly is the character most like him, and Sam Tarly is full of, like, negative self-talk and, like, oh, I'm just a fat coward and I can't get anything right. And I think George Martin absolutely has those anxieties and he absolutely has those concerns and, like... And he has talked in his blog posts about, like, you know, oh, some of you think I'm going to die before I finish the story, but but F you if you say that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to get it done, but oh, am I going to get it done? Oh, I've had long nights of the... So-. You know, George Martin is in his feelings. And, and look, I mean, like, it, it's probably in poor taste to speculate on the, you know, emotional well-being of real living people, so I, I guess I should shut up, but... um. But George Martin has a lot of feelings, my dude. He has a lot of feelings, and I think that's part of why he hasn't finished the story. But also, as he has said, a big part of why he hasn't finished the story is because the story is huge. The Winds of Winter is not so much one novel as a dozen different novels that intertwine and interconnect, George has said. Um, and, you know, George George has made progress. He, he, he has recently said that he is about 70% done through the book. Um, so I think that we probably will get the Winds of Winter at some point in the next few years, but um, but yeah, George certainly has a lot of feelings, and he certainly has a lot of distractions with all of the spin-off shows happening. Thank you for the super chat from Toxiclaw, who says, I've watched all of your abridged episodes and have been waiting for another. Thank you for all the good times. Question, would you rather live in Westeros or Essos? I would absolutely prefer to live in Essos. I mean, it depends where in Essos obviously. Like, I would not want to live in a shy. Uh, I would not like to live in Bone Town. Oh, maybe I would. Um, but no, like, I think that uh, Bravos seems like a pretty good place to live. I think Pentos seems like an okay place to live if you're rich. Um, uh, Bravos is probably best. Although then again, like, somewhere like Old Town seems pretty sweet. Like, Old Town is the biggest city, and it's, like, the most developed and it's got the university and it's got the high tower and it's got you know I, I think i think old town has a lot going for it like amon talks about how great the cider is at, at the pubs there yeah i think i think old town would be nice um and it's pre- and it's relatively far away from the wars plaguing westeros but um i i, I think that you know G- george martin does show us that essos and the free cities are better than Westeros in a lot of ways. Like, Westeros is kind of the the, the savage, brutal, uh, war-torn land compared to Essos, or parts of Essos, so, you know, probably Essos. Schubert reads in the live chat, says, what about the Summer Isles? And I agree, the Summer Isles are like the land of peace and sex and good times. So, yeah, the Summer Isles would probably be a great place as well and remember to check out schubert reads's youtube channel for uh his readings of books and thank you schubert reads for being a moderator uh unfortunately uh old town has a bit of a euron infestation zine bean says which yeah indeed that that is true and and scarlet mccain in the live chat says that it sucks to be a peasant or a slave compared to a merchant or a ruler and yeah, I mean, that that's one of the other points, of course, of the series, is that it's not so much about where you are, it's where you are in the class hierarchy. A Song of Ice and Fire is very much criticizing uh, feudalism and stuff. And of course, you know, I've seen people in the comments go, wow, George Martin's biting, biting criticism of feudalism would have been so relevant 2,000 years ago. And like, yeah, fine. But, but, but I mean, of course, wh- when George Martin critiques medieval feudalism, he's not just criticizing medieval feudalism. He's criticizing any kind of class structure and power structure. And of course, um, all of that is relevant today. Thank you uh, for the super chat from Sir Altshrift Flowers, who says, Father, war update. Rivers lost his legs. Hill and snow have died, and stone is imprisoned in the vale. We march very soon, was the reach and the west. Sound like it's going great, son. Keep up the good work. Proud of you. 
Olivia says, love the streams, thank you. My question is, what A Song of Ice and Fire book is your favorite and why? I love A Storm of Swords because it is the culmination, it is the climax of the previous two books, and it has some of the best moments, like Tyrion killing Tywin, which I, I think is some of the best writing George has done. Um, and while I have a lot of love for what's going on in Feast and A Dance with Dragons, I particularly love the Northern Lords in Winterfell and the complex slow boil that goes on in the North. Uh, Feast and Dance don't have a climax. <laughs> like, there are no battles in Feast and Dance. There is no culmination. There is no conclusion to, to, the, to all the build-up that happens there. Uh, I think that they are poorly structured in that respect. Um, and, you know, Game of Thrones and Clash are good. I mean, Clash is fun for the magical elements and the sort of thematic elements and the spooky story elements. But, um, yeah, I think Storm is my favorite. Thanks very much for the super chats from Alexandra, who sends love to the favorite channel. Thank you, Carson, who says, once you guys finish the food ranking, you should do the best deaths. Could be fun. Thank you for all the hours of S tier content. Thanks, Carson. And Carson says, also, they say Targaryens with dark purple eyes can look black, and in the beginning of Book 1, Jon is actually described as having black eyes. Since he lives in the cloudy north, I think he actually has dark purple eyes. Yeah, well that well that's a thing with, like, uh, isn't it Daemon Blackfire II? Um, he, he sort of has blue eyes that look purple, or vice versa, and, and like, young Griff has... has blue eyes that look purple but they're kind of more blue that that is a thing when we're talking about you know targaryen identity type things and yeah i, I mean john's eyes are described as being gray uh but a very dark gray so dark gray they almost look black so i i i don't think that john's eyes are purple i i think that they are dark gray like that's what it says but i mean you're right that that could have a a purpley element to it, what with his Targaryen heritage. So I think that's part of what's going on as well, potentially. Um, but look, may, may, I mean, maybe they'll turn purple when he gets resurrected, like a ready purple, uh, a mix between Stoneheart and Rhaegar and Ghost and all of those different magical and genetic elements coming together. Um, that also would be fun. Okay, um, thank you everybody for the super chats and the donations. That's very kind. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Game of Thrones Abridged Podcast with Alt Swift X. Uh, please do press like, please press subscribe. You can follow this podcast, you can listen to this podcast on Spotify or on any podcast app of your choice. Links are in the description. Uh, we'll do more live streams in the future. We'll do more stuff with Glidus. We'll do more stuff. We'll do more episodes of... A cock abridged. I can't promise exactly when these things will happen, but I'm excited to do all of them. If you have any last uh, things you'd like me to say, uh, say now or hold your peace. But uh, otherwise, thank you so much for joining in, everybody. This was fun. Uh, thank you, Madison Martino, who says, Favorite Targaryen era? I love the chaos of Magor's reign. But good old Jaehaerys' peace reign is the best to live through. Uh, yeah, I mean, Magor's is certainly tumultuous. I, I mean, I think there's a good reason why they make the House of the Dragon TV show about the Dance of the Dragons, you know, Rhaenyra, a Aegon era. I, I think that is very fun and interesting. Um, I, I'm very curious about, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, and again, like Duncan Egg is set around like the, uh, the Daeron the second and then the Aenys era and i think that is also a very interesting time like blood ravens entanglement with the targaryens of that era is really interesting so that's really cool um i i'm curious about the sort of like summer hall era like king eggs era and and you know if if we are blessed with another with another 10 duncan egg books then we might find we might get to see king eggs reign um i hope i hope but um yeah, and the whole, like, Jaehaerys the Second and, like, J Jaehaerys the Second marrying Aerys and Rhaella and the Woods Witch and lots of interesting stuff there with the Children of Egg. So, I mean, I mean, they're all, <laughs> they're all interesting. I, I, I guess the least interesting to me is, like, I don't know, maybe the Young Dragon and his War in Dawn. That's not all that interesting. George is very interested in um, Aegon the Fourth, uh, the Unworthy. Oh, no, Aegon... 
yeah, Aegon the Fourth, the Unworthy. Uh, he has talked about wanting to write more about him, so that could definitely be interesting. But uh, yeah, uh, my bastard son, Sir Ultra Flowers, is is marching into battle. Good luck, my bastard son. Remember to wield uh, the Valyrian steel crab fork well. And uh, we'll see y'all in the next one. Uh, stay hydrated, as Hairless Oyster says, and uh, eat veggies and do cardio. And uh, see y'all next time. Thanks so much for participating. Cheers. <laughs>